Uh, it is good to be here with you. Uh, my name is not Pastor Bob, in case you couldn't tell. Um, I am John. I normally am up here with my guitar singing, but this morning I am here to bring the word. So we've been talking about the commands of Jesus. Uh, what are the things that Jesus gives us as operational directives or the go do this that he gives us? And so we're going to pick up today in Luke chapter 14. It says this, and Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, or your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So I find it helpful in situations like this to give somewhat of a backstory. So Jesus is eating a Sabbath meal. Um, the, the Sabbath was instituted in Jewish history as a, a day that was specifically for rest, to commune with God and to commune with people. And so what you see is Jesus is at the house of, they call him a prominent Pharisee, a prominent, a big time religious leader. Um, and he is here for this Sabbath meal. And the other people gathered, believe it or not, are the man's friends and his brothers and sisters and his relatives and his rich neighbors. How do we know this? Because a few verses earlier, it says that Jesus asked the, ph the Pharisees and the experts in the law, is it, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? So who's there? The Pharisees and the experts in the law. So these are the people who could, in effect, invite the host back for a, a return uh, gathering. They could bring a gift to this gathering. They could increase the social status of the host. And at the same time, it looked good for the host to have people over on the Sabbath day. And so what you could start to have happen if you weren't careful is that this Sabbath that was intended to be for rest for all people and for community with God and with man is it could become calculated. It could become an expectation of a returned kindness, that I give you this and you give me this back with this select circle of invitees, of Pharisees and, and, and high-level religious rulers who carry a certain social status and they make each other look good. I find it helpful in situations like this to give a disclaimer of what Jesus is not saying because I feel like if you read that, that passage that I just read, the first thing that you come away with is you're like, did Jesus just tell me that I'm not allowed to hang out with my friends? And I think what you see, if you look at the life, of, the narrative of scripture, the life of Jesus, he's not attacking friendships. Um, Jesus has lots of friends and he invests in those friendships. And if you watch him, he actually teaches and shows us how to be a great friend. And here, what he's doing, as he does so often, is he is teaching, correcting, guiding, addressing the motivations of the human heart and the actions that result of those. So something, that, something, another disclaimer will say, there's not something inherently wrong with this type of gathering, as I just said, of having people over who they could invite you back and they could bring a gift, those types of things. It is not wrong. What Jesus says is, it does not produce an eternal reward. It produces an earthly reward when you get invited back. And so I thought it was worth looking at what are the other places that you see this dynamic of an eternal reward versus an earthly reward in Jesus' teaching. So in Matthew chapter six, Jesus talks about gifts that you give in order to be seen and honored by others, you get your earthly reward. Versus gifts that are given in private, anonymously, you get a heavenly reward. He talks about prayer that you do intentionally in a public place to be seen by others, you get your earthly reward. Versus prayer that's done in private, you get a heavenly reward. He talks about fasting, which I'm not a big fan of. He talks about fasting. Which, if you fast to be seen by others, if you make yourself look bad while you're fasting, that you get your reward. But if you fast and you don't let anybody know that you're fasting and you do it in private, you get heaven's reward. Do you see the common thread? When we do something in order to be seen as better because of it, we are engaging in what I'm going to call transactionality. And no, it's not a real word, so I apologize to the English teachers out there. But in essence, transactionality is this. I do this, and I get this for it. So what's Jesus saying about inviting people who could then, who will then invite you back or who will bring a gift? He's saying it's transactional. Like I give, and I get. 
So what happens when I help someone with their work? Because I know that probably at some point I might need their help back. I give and I get. What happens when I give somebody a gift and I make sure that a bunch of other people kind of saw me give the gift because I want them to know that I'm a pretty generous guy and I'm pretty good at these things. I give and I get. What about when I volunteer my time and I make a significant deal of posting about it because I want people to know that I'm a good dude and I was out here doing this thing for these people at this time? I give and I get. Or I have my boss and his wife over and I show them what a good family my family is and what a good investment we would be for the future. I give and I get. Transactional. So Jesus is saying that's one way to live. You, you, you give and you get. You get this earthly reward. But he's also saying, let me show you another way. And I think in this specific command, we have a couple qualms with Jesus. I'm a big fan of the word qualm. It's not used enough. <laughs> and our first qualm is this. I would never. You see, sometimes our first reaction to hearing Jesus call out this transactional way of living where my time is given to those who will give something back to me and I ignore the other people is this, I would never. How dare that you insinuate that I could be so selfish as to do that. And I believe that we believe that when we say it. Because I actually think people don't live transactionally on purpose. I think it actually happens naturally without us realizing because we get these blinders. As a, as a teenager, if you ever heard a teenager say it, or maybe even as a college student, you could hear people be like, these are my people, us against the world. As long as I got them, I don't need nobody else. But then you become an adult and you're more refined. And so you say it like this, well, I don't have time. And the time that I do have, I, I wanna spend it with the people that I love. And again, Jesus isn't saying that you can't invest in the people that you love. But the question is, what happens when your time and your resources are dedicated only to the people that you want to be around all the time? And there are two things. The first is you get exclusivity. So I have my pocket of people that I want to be around, that I choose to be around here. But you have your pocket of people that are over here. And you develop these pockets and they become exclusive things. And I only associate with the people in this circle because that's my circle. And you start with exclusivity, and then eventually exclusivity becomes division. And what happens is we're so focused on these are the people in my group and I rock with these people, but I definitely don't rock with these people over here because they're in this circle and they voted for this person and I'm really not down with that. And I'm really not down with these people because they interpret this part of the Bible differently than I do and that's not okay. And we really just, just disassociate with these people because I argued with them on Facebook yesterday. And the truth is, I'm actually not here to talk about any of those things. What I want to look at is you have your pocket in their pocket in their pocket in their pocket. And what you end up with is there's these people who don't fit anywhere. And so they float in between all of these warring factions because they're not welcome in any group until eventually they exist only conceptually in your mind where you are neither kind nor mean to them. You actually miss that they're there. The only time that you would be aware is if one, you can improve your social status by being around them in a charitable sense, or two, when they become a problem to you. What was the condition of Jesus says, the poor, the lame, the cripple, and the blind? What was their societal status? They were the outcasts. They were the those people over there, and they floated between warring factions always there and never seen, unless it was for the sake of charity or because they were a problem. Now, like I said, this division that we create amongst our world where where we miss these people, it happens naturally. My, My guy, the Pharisee, the host, he invited people into his life, into his house, not for no reason. He had a reason to. They were his friends. They were his relatives. They were his brothers and sisters and his rich neighbors. The truth is that they could return and probably would return the invite. They might bring a gift to the gathering. It improved his social status to be seen with these good standing people in his house. And it looked good for him to have people over on the Sabbath all at the same time. So why do you not see the people that Jesus is talking about? Why do you not see the poor people and the people with these physical limitations? 
Because what reason did he have to invite them? Were they going to return the invite? Were they going to bring something to the party? The bougie people don't want to be with him. It doesn't look good to have them at his house. It happens naturally. And here's the thing that I, I, this is actually the key to everything that I'm going to say today. It's not just that the people that Jesus is telling him to invite, it's not that they wouldn't give back to him, it's that they actually couldn't. They were incapable of giving him a gift or a return invite or increasing his social status. The only thing that he could get from inviting these people would be other people thinking that he was a good person. But even that would be overshadowed by the people who saw that and said, why would you associate with those people? You're talking about the lowest of low in their society. The people that float between the factions. They have nowhere to go. They could not offer him increased social standing. They could not offer him wealth. They could not offer him a return invite even if they wanted to. And so he has no natural, no transactional reason to host them. And so why would Jesus say to host these people who are incapable of reciprocating the gift? What reason does he have to do that? I'm not actually gonna answer the question. I just wanted to take a really long pause. I'm gonna ask another question instead. When was the last time in your life that you poured your resources and your time into someone who is incapable of giving you a return invite, a return gift, or an increased social status. Someone who literally could not repay their gift to you or help you in return, even if they wanted to. Someone who you could pour your energy into, but you knew that you were not going to get energy back. You see, for some of us, uh, our time is actually more precious than our resources and it's harder to give. For some of us, it's actually easier to do something for someone than to spend time with someone. And then for others of us, we can give our time, but we kind of hold our money like this. But what does Jesus say? He says to host the people that everyone else ignores. And being a true host means moving away from transactionality. Why? Well, what are the responsibilities of a host? You're responsible for setup cost. You're responsible for food cost. You're responsible for the invites. And you're responsible for being present in the moment. You're responsible for the hospitality. You're responsible for sitting with people and laughing with people and listening to people. You are both the financial backer and the social giver. And what you see is that if you're present in the moment, and your focus is on the people who are in front of you, the people who you are pouring into, if your focus is there, then it's not focused on what you could get back from them. Being a true host means moving away from transactionality. So like I said, qualm number one is I would never, but then eventually we see that this transactional mindset is something that we can very easily fall into. It happens naturally, and we actually need something supernatural to help us out of it. So we get to that qualm number one and we get through it and we're like, okay, you know what? I want to fight against this. I, I want to own this thing. I, I, I want to do it. And then you get to qualm number two. But who would I host? See, I don't know anyone in these categories that Jesus just listed. So where would I even start? Where are these people who are incapable of giving back to me what I would, what I would give to them? Let me expand this morning our views of what it looks like, our horizons of what it looks like to be incapable of giving back. Uh, when I was in college, when I was a junior in college, my pastor and his wife, they started this thing called family dinners. So how it worked was they would make a ton of food on Sunday during football hour, and they would invite any family from the church, but they would also invite any of us from our local college, which was included me, and so anybody could come and anybody could be part of family dinner. Now, let me tell you, as a junior in college, what I was not doing. I was not bringing anything to contribute to the meal. I was not bringing no gifts for the family. And if you saw my dorm room, which violated several health codes, you know I was not gonna invite them back. So I was not, right? I was not. I was not increasing social standing. I was not bringing no gifts. I was not inviting them back. I was not, I was not, I was not. You know what I was? Hungry and broke. 
And at 4 p.m. every Sunday, I got all my, I'm pretty large, I got all my other large football friends, and we got in the car, and I made sure that there was enough gas in it, because you know being a college student, you got to make sure you have enough gas to get where you're going, and we would drive over, and we would enjoy a good meal with good people. So tell me, was I capable of giving anything back? Why'd they do it? Still not going to answer it, but we're getting closer. Other examples. Anybody, let me preface this. If you're in middle school, there are good days ahead. Anybody who works with middle schoolers in their spare time. Because if you're a little kid, you're very cute. And if you're a high schooler, you're the leader of tomorrow. And if you're a middle schooler, you're struggling. Like, it's, that is a tough time of life. We lived it. So the people who dedicate themselves, they dedicate their time to, to working with or volunteering with middle schoolers, I think that they have a special place, treasures in heaven. Like we all get a house probably, but they get a community center specifically dedicated to them. <laughs> it has to. Because what middle schooler is going to say, hey, I brought you this gift? Or hey, you, you can come back and hang out at my house in my room. It also probably violates several health codes. <laughs> they can't. They're incapable of giving something back in return. So why do people do it? How about this? There's a group of people from our church that goes down to the Open Door Mission on the first Wednesday of every month for something called Coffee Hour with the homeless people. And there's coffee and there's biscuits and they just sit there and they talk for an hour. They just talk. And so what can be given back in that situation? Can't get a return invite from someone who doesn't have a home. So why do you do it? How about this? We got people who from our church go into the, the local school, uh, School 25, our partner school, and they work with these kids who come from really, really difficult homes. And teachers who are just out of college and who are trying to corral these kids, what can they give back? So why do you do it? We got people who are uh, working with refugee families to be a good neighbor to them, to help them get to their appointments, to help them figure out how to read their mail. What can they give back? Why do you do it? What do all these things have in common? Me at, me at college, the, the middle schoolers, the, the people who don't have a home, the kids from broken families, the refugees. How could you locate the person in your life who fits into this category? This is, I try to boil it down, and the truth is I think that the Holy Spirit is a large part of it, probably all of it. But I was trying to figure out a practical way to say this to you. Who is the person in your life where you look at them and you think this? They'll figure it out eventually. Like that college student, they are struggling, and they don't really have any friends right now, but they'll figure it out eventually. They'll graduate. They'll move on. Like that middle schooler, they're going through a tough time right now, but they won't be there forever. They'll figure it out eventually. That person with no home, they're struggling financially, they'll figure it out eventually. They'll find somewhere to be. That kid from a broken home and that teacher who's struggling to corral them in school, they'll get there. That displaced family, you know, over the course of time, they'll learn how things work here. They'll figure it out. That person who recently got divorced, yeah, they're really struggling right now. They don't have anybody in their corner. They don't have anybody to care for them. They'll get there eventually. They'll figure it out. That person who, who has a, a, a physical disability or, or a mental disability and they're struggling and they're trying to figure out what life looks like in the world, like eventually people will come around them and they'll figure it out. That statement could be applied to every single one of those situations. Could have been applied to the people in Jesus' time, right? That person who's poor, they'll figure it out. That person who is crippled, they will figure it out. But it wasn't. My pastors hosted us. The youth leaders still pick up kids. People still go into the schools and they help the teachers. People still spend their time eating and talking with people who don't have a home. And the question is, why do they do it? And I've been waiting 17 minutes to answer this question. Philippians chapter two. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross, pause. What were we capable of giving him? 
He is in very nature God. Could we give him a return invite? No. But he surrounded himself with the sick. Could we give him a meaningful gift, something that he's lacking, something that he needs? Heck no. And yet he spent his life serving and teaching. Could I increase the social standing of God? Laughable. But he suffered and died on a cross for a consequence that I had earned by my own wickedness. And so why would you give your time or your resources to people who are poor, people who are blind, people who are crippled, to the broke college student, to the middle schooler, to the refugee, to the homeless person, to the elementary school teacher, to the person who you know is going to drain your energy and you're probably not going to get it back. Why? You only give to those who cannot reciprocate if you know what it's like to feel as though you have no worth. And then to have a king look at you and say, I think you're worth my everything. Becky actually said it when we started service today. She said, before you chose God, God chose you. So in Luke 14, as he so often does, Jesus is inviting you to pour your time and your resources into people that no one else pays attention to because they don't fit into any of those groups. But he looks at them and says, you're worth my time. You're worth my money. You're worth my energy. And you're worth my everything. Mark chapter 10 says, you know that those who are regarded as rulers, as Gentiles, uh, they lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. What is the opposite of transactional? Relational. That I would understand so deeply that I am loved by the God who created the entire universe that he would send his son out of that love to redeem and restore my relationship to him and that that love would just overflow out of me and pour out of me and I would seek all of the people who have been told and shown by the world that they're not worthy and I would scream to them with my words and my actions and everything that I have that they are loved and they are, they are worthy of my love more than they could imagine and they have a place with me. That I would see this relationship that I have found, this relationship that has found me, and I would invite others into it. That their life would become my life. That their family would become my family, and that my world would become their world. Relational is way scarier than transactional. Because when I pour myself out transactionally, I have one eye on what I'm doing and I have one eye looking ahead to see what I will get back. It's a closed transaction. But when I pour myself out relationally, I have one eye on what's happening and I have one eye on Jesus who came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, including me. And in doing so, well, yeah, that's fine. Oh, okay. <laughs> and in doing so, he restored a broken relationship and he invited me back in. And so I invite others back in. And so I moved from a closed transaction to an open life. We actually sang the vision of this this morning. We said, uh, your spirit breaking out, your kingdom moving in, your victory claims the ground that the enemy had. That's the vision. That is an open life that God's spirit would break out of me and that God's kingdom would come in. So the other thing is, this is one of those interesting messages. I'm not actually gonna tell you that you're going to see the reward of your actions tomorrow if you do this. Um, if you look at that Philippians passage we read, Jesus gave himself to people and he was crucified. And so you might see some beautiful things come out of this if, you, if you're willing to pour your time and your gifts and your life. You might see some beautiful things come of that, or you might not. That's not actually the promise. And some of you know that because you've been living this out, and you know that you're tired, and you associate very closely with the crucified Jesus because you feel like you're pouring yourself out and you have not experienced any of the life that's on the other side of that. So hear me today. Jesus said in Luke 14, you pour yourself out for those that everyone overlooks. You will be blessed. 
you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So what is on the other side of Jesus' crucifixion? If we pick up in that Philippians passage, it says, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the promise. When you extend your time and your resources and your family and your life relationally to those who will not increase your social status and they can't return your gift, to those who you look at them and you say, well, they'll figure it out one day. When you decide to purposely invest in them relationally, you are walking in the footsteps of Jesus. And yes, Jesus was crucified, but what came of that if not all of humanity being redeemed to God and to all that is good? Jesus' life, death, and resurrection was freedom and life and goodness. And when you walk in his footsteps, your life is freedom and life and goodness. And I'm definitely not saying that when you get to heaven, you're gonna be the name that every tongue will confess or that everybody's gonna be bowing to you. Maybe out of respect, hopefully. But if God honored Jesus for giving himself in totality to those who couldn't give back, and if he says that those who give themselves to others who can't give back will be blessed and repaid in heaven, then do you trust that he will keep his word to you? And do you believe that an eternal reward is better than any reward that you could have on earth? So if that's you, and you've been pouring yourself out to the overlooked, and you're really tired, and you haven't seen the results of it, hear me that you are walking in the footsteps of your Savior. Be encouraged that your reward is in heaven, and the fruit of your life on earth is life and goodness and freedom. I'm gonna invite the worship team out. So let's get practical. And actually, if we're gonna get practical, I think this is worth, this is actually the time where I'm gonna pray. Um, So if you'd pray with me. Lord, as we move into the practicality of this message, I'm asking that, as I said earlier, your Holy Spirit is what we actually need um, in order to direct us forward, in order for us to see and to know um, who you have called us to care for. So I ask for that in Jesus' name. All right, so practically, what's your area? Who's the person or who are the people in your life that right now you look at them and you could say, they'll figure it out eventually. Could you open your home once a month to somebody or to several people who are incapable of of giving back to you? Like they can't even bring anything to your house and they definitely aren't gonna invite you back. Don't make a big deal of it, but find a time in your calendar and invite them, host them. Is there someone in your life who you can give your time to? You could pick them up, take them out to coffee, even pay for them. They probably aren't gonna give you anything in return. You're probably gonna use a lot of your energy, but you can give it to them. Make time. And maybe you don't have time, and I respect that, but maybe you know someone who's struggling and you could get them a fruit basket or bake them some cookies or get them a gift card for a date night and you know that they can't give you anything back. Give it anonymously. All right, I'm gonna invite you to take out your phone or a pen or a computer, whatever you have that you could write with. There's a pen in the seat back in front of you. I'll give you time, go ahead. Something to write on. Here's what you're gonna write. One sentence. What is your way to give to someone who is incapable of returning your gift this week? It can be a name. It can be what you're gonna do. Use it as a reminder to ping you. And if it's something that you're already doing, that's awesome. And use it as a reminder to encourage you to continue to invest in that thing. But who's the person? that you can give your time, your resources, that you can pour yourself into. The words of the song that we're about to sing are this. Love goes to lowly depths to wash the sinner's feet, so I will follow you to serve the least of these. When you know what it is like to be called worth it by the King of Kings, Love for the least of these will literally flow out of the love that he has poured into you. When you walk in love, you walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Your reward is in heaven. Your fruit on earth is life and goodness and freedom. 
So if you believe that, I'm gonna invite you to stand to your feet. If you believe this, I will follow you to serve the least of these. Then we're gonna sing it. And if we're gonna sing it, we're gonna live it. Yeah? Let's sing together.